quick PSA. During this episode, you might hear my ad about my other show, 17 Karat K-Pop. That's why it'll say you're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. You are not. You're listening to my other show, Enthusiast. But please do support both. You can find episode directories to both on my Substack as well as the Enthusiast episode guide in the episode description of what you're listening to today. Hi, everybody. Welcome back at long last to Enthusiasts. It's been quite a while, but I'm finally back with a really exciting interview. I did it with the author of Burn It Down, Power, Complicity, and a Call for Change in Hollywood by Maureen Ryan, aka Mo Ryan. She had some really insightful things to say, and I really love the book. The book is divided into two parts. The first half of that book dives into the behind-the-scenes stories about onset turmoil with Sleepy Hollow, Lost, SNL, etc., and the culture at large enabling that misbehavior, to put it mildly. The second half of the book lays out a blueprint for how those sets could improve, getting some interesting insights from a rabbi, a psychiatrist, someone who's been through restorative justice, trying to find solutions in a better way forward. So I do think this conversation will be insightful for any industry, anyone who can help foster a culture, a workplace culture that is better for all. That's all tease about what the book is about and what our discussion dives into. Here's my conversation with Mo Ryan. Before we even get to specific topics in the book, could you share a bit about kind of just the backstory of not just the book, but how you even started reporting in the first place and covering Hollywood and how that maybe kind of naturally led to the themes that came together to make a book? Yeah, I mean, I really, I started out, I went to journalism school because I just, I'm just interested in the world, I guess. And I had done a bunch of traveling and I have dipped my toe into fiction at times and I may do so again, but I think, you know, kind of making sense of the world through writing nonfiction has been a thing for me for a long time. And so I naturally gravitated to popular culture when I first began working as a sort of journalist, critic, reporter, whatever you want to call it. And then, um, you know, I kind of, I had my own zine. I I bounced around. I did a lot of freelancing in the 90s. And then I ended up at the Chicago Tribune, you know, a big city newspaper. I was hired in their culture sections. I did a bunch of different jobs there. And I really enjoyed that. And I enjoyed writing about TV because, you know, around, you know, the turn of the aughts, so to speak, there was so much exciting television that was happening. And not just even scripted. You know, I remember the summer that Survivor premiered. And it was just like the world turned upside down because this, you know, summer reality show on CBS, you know, a network that not many people took that seriously at the time was completely addictive and everyone was talking about it. And then, you know, around that time, the early aughts, you had Sopranos and The Shield and, you know, so many incredible dramas, Battlestar Galactica. There were so many cool shows, even American Idol. I wrote about it a lot back in the day. So much exciting fare out there. And I just kept gravitating to it. And so eventually I ended up as the TV critic there and I just kind of stayed on that path. So I've always done a mixture of reporting and criticism. You know, there was the word critic was in my job title for, I don't know, over 20 years. So that's was sort of the umbrella, I guess, that I was working under. But I've always done feature stories, profiles, trend pieces, opinion pieces, reported things, Q&As. And so I kind of always had those dual tracks running in how I approached covering popular culture. TV is not the only thing I've ever written about, but in much of it, you know, 20 to 15 to 10 years ago was driven by by um, premium cable networks, cable networks. You know, there was still really good stuff, a a number of broadcast shows. So it was just a really exciting time. And then, you know, about a decade or so ago, there was the explosion of streamers, which again, you know, drove a new wave of evolution in TV. So it was just so interesting to cover it as someone who assessed things as a critic, but also someone who assessed things and tried to figure things out as a reporter and commentator. You know, just there was just endless fodder for writing about the world through the lens of television, really, you know, because American television in the time that I've been writing about it has been on this incredible journey. And I, you know, many people have argued, yes, of course, film industries in many nations are very influential and important. But I think what I was kind of in the front row for and lucky to be in the front row for was in America anyway, I'm not trying to pit TV and film against each other. I think they both have their strengths. But what happened during my ride, so to speak, in a, many other critics' ride, was that we saw television rise up to be on a par culturally and in terms of importance with film. And in some ways, I think even become more maybe influential in a number of ways. 
I've focused more heavily in recent years on, to some degree, you know, opinion or trend writing, but more and more into reporting, in part because I think it's necessary and, you know, not to sound like a hopelessly egomaniac monster person, but I think other people thought it was necessary, you know, not just from me, but from many critics, reporters, commentators, news journalists, whatever. Many people have been doing the kind of work that, frankly, for many entertainment industries, especially the American entertainment industry, has been long overdue. And I, I guess I felt like if I have these contacts and if I happen to have these skills, people are willing to trust me with some very sensitive reporting, then I will, I'll try to do my bit, you know, as sort of a method of, I don't know if it's too presumptuous to say giving back, but I, I think really it is actually a form of giving back because, you know, Hollywood has actually given me a lot. You know, it's given me a lot of entertainment, a lot of things to think about. But the people who make it, you know, as individuals, they have given me a great deal. And there are so many incredibly skilled storytellers and craftspeople and artisans in so many realms in many entertainment industries. But the one I happen to have contacts is, is within is, is the American entertainment industry. And so if they felt that I, with my skill sets, could help them create a better future, or at least, you know, a roster of things not to do. This is no shade to anybody, but like, I wouldn't know how to create a certain kind of costume or, you know, a certain kind of, you know, 16th century historical epic. Like, I don't know how to sew, right? But, mm -hmm. you know, so it's no shade to say that you know, many people in the entertainment industry, maybe they've had some contact with the media, but do they understand how in-depth, responsible reporting is done? They may not just have had a lot of experience with that. So that, that's something I've been able to offer up within a setting that I think the way I kind of structure the reporting that I do is that if someone approaches me, certainly at first, I make it clear to them that there's no expectation that something has to happen or has to become public. Um, these are often very, you know, shaken people, people who are afraid for their jobs, for their mental health, for the, even for their physical safety. So, so I try to just lay out, act as a resource for them and say, here's how journalism would work if you want to work with me. If I tried to summarize the book in like one phrase, I would say it's the quiet part out loud, like what <laughs> everyone wants to say, but they're. Maybe... I'm so glad you said that. Honestly, that's, it's really true. Um, yeah. Cause I feel like, I mean, it touches on a lot of things that feel like they've just been relevant for so long. And it's like kind of a call to like, hello, like, you know, like, like what are we yeah. doing? <laughs> yeah. And there's so much. There's so much that we sort of absorb and imbibe, whether we're partaking of entertainment, you know, watching films and TV, or even if you're within them, there are so many norms and standards and folkways and ideas that we unconsciously absorb. And actually, you know, I say that a lot in the book, like I unconsciously absorbed this thing that I shouldn't have unconsciously absorbed, you know? Yeah. I'm so glad that you said that because sometimes, you know, especially in the writing of this book, even, you know, having even having been around the industry and been writing about it for so many years, I was like, at certain points, am I going to sound dumb or naive for saying this? Is this, you know, like no one wants to be the square person at the party who everyone's like, oh, God, they're so uncool. You know, like, <laughs> why are you saying that? Or it's. I think it helps that what to me came through really clear while I was I was reading the book that I appreciate is that it's your kind of analysis of what should change is very um, big picture as opposed to like, I mean, this isn't like a book that's like focused on the personal, it's mm -hmm. the systemic. Yeah. And I feel like it comes through in the writing that like, you're saying all this because you care, you know, it's not like a hit oh, piece. So yeah. It's, it, yeah, it just shows you truly appreciate the what TV could be. It's like the kind of love you have for something that's imperfect, but that's mm -hmm. why you, you care so much about changing it. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And thank you for saying all those things. That's that's exactly what I was going for. And, you know, I think it's probably a truism that a lot of people can identify with that you have the worst fights of your life with the people that you care about the most. And that's mm -hmm. why they're the worst fights of your life, because you're like, wait, why is this person um, who I trust, you know, and have had this relationship with, why are they why is this conversation taking this terrible turn? Like when you care about people, that's when it's really charged and really difficult. So I'm glad it came through that. I am angry. I am angry that so many people were needlessly subjected and still are sometimes too many times needlessly subjected to unsafe working conditions, you know, unsafe on a number of fronts, vindictive behavior, patterns of exploitation of all kinds. And yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm angry about that. And, you know, to some degree, I mean, I don't know if it's 
if I would say I'm angry with myself, you know, I, I think part of being a human being is you learn where you have misplaced your trust. You know, I made assumptions and I can't necessarily fault myself for all of the assumptions that I made because one thing that I say a lot lately is I don't want to live in the world where nobody gives anyone else the benefit of the doubt because that seems like an incredibly dark place to live. But what makes me angry is when giving people or shows or institutions the benefit of the doubt, when that's kind of weaponized against, you know, the innocent fan or the sort of like just garden variety critic or reporter or whatever. You know, I, I often feel like there was a concerted effort to, and still is in some cases, there's a concerted effort to cover up certain things and kind of weaponize people's willingness to give shows or people or studios the benefit of the doubt. And I, I, I don't like that at all. I, you know, like, let's just be adults. And what's really odd to me is that I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm on the par of like a well-known showrunner, but I'm, I'm going to make an analogy to me personally and that I hope doesn't sound arrogant or self-aggrandizing, but you know, the book has been successful. I have more followers across social media. I've been lucky enough to give a number of interviews and have interest in the book and have it written about and reviewed and including some high profile places. And I'm like, I actually texted a friend of mine the other day. I'm like, to have this success, which is so lovely and wonderful and kind of overwhelming in a good way. I understand it less when people use their success to wreak havoc on those with less power or no power. I like, I understand mm -hmm. that less now. It's like, oh, cool. My book is on the bestseller list. I'm going to find somebody powerful, powerless and ruin their day. Like what I get that less than I did now. Cause I'm like, wow, this feels nice. Like I worked really hard on something and people like it. And the idea that, oh, now I can, you know, behave monstrously. That gets to, you tackle 10 main myths about Hollywood. There are three ones that I'm particularly interested in hearing more about. And one is super relevant to what you just said, which is this myth of the necessary monster. Would you mind just sharing a story from the book of that or the opposite? Because I think what I found extra important for people to read is when you actually gave examples of, hey, it's actually not that hard. Here's a positive workplace. Right. Here's what they did that's actually helpful. It doesn't cost what you think it does to just... It's not a prerequisite to deal with the abusive type of work environment and that no. kind of thing. No, not at all. I mean, one example, a nightmare director walking around haranguing people, you know, like just a small example. I mean, Easy Riders Raging Bulls is a great book. But, you know, there's examples in there of, you know, Dennis Hopper or even George Lucas, like screaming at people or, you know, acting out as directors. And do you think that the crew on those, like in a movie where people are being constantly verbally abused, like, do you think they're being more productive? And, and that's the crazy thing is like, first of all, human beings are human beings. They should be accorded, you know, basic modicums of human decency. It's respect. It's not that mm -hmm. difficult. Like the, the baseline standards of human decency and acting in a humane fashion are not hard to figure out walk into any kindergarten and this <laughs> girl can explain it to you but do you think that you know there's one I, I, I'm not going to say who but I'll just say I do mention this person in my book but there was one kind of out of control person that I reported on uh, a number of times and or just you know sort of like I did some pretty heavy duty reporting on this person regardless of the humanity of the people affected which we shouldn't put that to one side but let's pretend for a minute we can that person cost them so much money because yeah. there were delays, the sets had to be torn down and, you know, rebuilt or no one wanted to, you know, build the sets or design the costumes or even, you know, create the costumes because this person would just come in and say, this is terrible, do it over again. So I know of jerks who have cost so many studios so much money that they're never going to recoup. And I'm like, what? What's the math? What? Oh, well, yeah. we have to go through these, you know, these difficult belt tightening stretches now. I'm like, okay, first of all, you're still paying your top execs and top show runners tens of millions of dollars so you're not there the budget cuts are never going to hit them you're just setting money on fire all the time by keeping people in this state of panic all the time if someone's just a rampaging jerk if someone on the set walks up to an act a female actor yanks down her top to show more of her chest is she going to give a good performance after that I don't think so, but I've heard of that happening. And the thing is, I've heard of it happening more than once. Like, this is not a rare, like, I wish I could say that's never happens, but it's something that's happened to my knowledge more than once. So it's like, are you going to get better work? No. Are you going to get timely cost savings? 
you know, is the work going to be, you know, not just acceptable, but thrifty and everyone goes home on time? No, nothing. I don't, I genuinely don't know what people are gaining. And, you know, sometimes they will put up with stuff like that, but I wish in certain cases that the studios would just put out a press release saying, we don't care about who was damaged or who could be damaged by us continuing to have a relationship with this particular actor, director, whoever, producer. We don't care about any damage they create because we just think that they can make us money. You know, our executives might get bigger bonuses or whatever. Just say that. Like, if that's the truth of it, just say that. Don't say that you care because you don't. You know, people like Vince Gilligan, something I think about a lot is he created Better Call Saul. He co-created with Peter Gould Better Call Saul, and he created Breaking Bad. I think a lot about, like, not just people did not leave the employee of those shows. Sometimes they stayed for the whole runs, mainly because they were just liked the job, liked the gig, liked the vibe. They worked very hard, but they were treated well. But I think a lot about the institutional knowledge. People know so much more when they stay with a production for a long time. And in my world of covering TV, you know, sometimes as a fan, you're sitting there going, wait, did they forget that character that this happened to them two seasons ago? Because I feel like everybody forgot this except me. <laughs> like, yeah. Where's the continuity here? Where's the care being taken? And I think you can take more care with the story. You can actually dig into the characters and the world and the aesthetics more deeply when, like Melinda Shue Taylor, I provided a number of examples in the book of here's someone who survived punishing work environments at Lost, at Medium. Uh, you know, I think there were other punishing experiences in her career, but there was a problem on one of her shows with Black actors not feeling like the people in the hair department were particularly adept at doing their hair. That was an issue that could be mishandled, put it that way, and often is mishandled. <laughs> you know, and I have other examples of that. She was just simply accountable and said, okay, this is not acceptable to me. I'm sorry that this happened. How can we handle it? And they handled it. And what's interesting to me is I just got an email in, in my inbox the other day. I think there's a generation of people coming to power and have been coming to power for some time. And maybe Me Too and other reckonings were a little bit of a spark to this burn it down revolution. They're coming to power and realizing everything that they were told for so many years about, oh, well, if you're the showrunner, if you're the head person, if you're the head writer, if you're the person in charge, you have to behave in these inappropriate or unprofessional or damaging ways. They get into the power seat and they're like, no, I'm here. And I don't know. I don't see that. I don't see it. <laughs> like, I don't yeah. know that. Like, they're realizing they'd been fed that lie, and to whatever extent that they had accepted that lie, they're like, oh, no, no, I, I mean, and it is really stressful. It is really hard, but I am able to treat people in a professional manner. It's not causing the end of the world for me to treat people with a modicum of respect. You know, they're, they're getting yeah. that spot and they're like, no, this is all a set of completely insane, not okay norms, and we're going to burn them down. There's a phrase that really stuck out to me in the book, which I just feel like should be used more often when talking about Hollywood, which is knee-jerk enableism. Mm -hmm. I just thought that was a good way to put yeah. it, where it's like, that's very summative, right? It's this intuitive defensiveness of A-listers or the kind of people who can, like, have that persona of... Right. You know, here's the thing. It's so ingrained that we're only really, after a hundred years of Hollywood, starting to have the conversation about no. Okay. Like, and, 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 and as I made the point in the book, I see a therapist. Like, I understand people having, I understand people having neuroses, worries, anxiety, whatever the concern might be, like in having stress, having a bad day. I definitely understand that. My contention is not people should be robots that never have emotions. That's not my contention at all. Or people shouldn't put their life experience into their artistic work or their creative work. No, please do that. Taking out your personal issues on people who have nothing to do with those personal issues or taking out your damage, whatever it is, wherever it comes from, on other people in an unprofessional, toxic, bullying, biased, or in any other way damaging way. No, that's not the move. That's not, we're not doing that. And by the way, you know, as I make clear in the book and many other people have made clear in their reporting or their testimony or essays or whatever, the privilege of being able to do that is not extended to everyone. It's very much restricted to a very small subset of people who get this knee-jerk enabling. 
the knee jerk enabling has to be stopped. You know, it just does. Or if you're going to do knee jerk enabling, just call it what it is and don't say, oh, well, I'm being compassionate to this actor or this um, known monster showrunner. I'm just being, he's just a damaged person. Okay. Mm -hmm. He can be damaged. She can be damaged. That's okay. All of us are damaged in some way. Like, that's not an excuse. I know plenty of people who have been in damaging environments who have had extremely difficult life experiences or professional experiences. And you know what they don't do? Take that out on people that have nothing to do with any of that. Yeah, there's a really, really, a quote that I just really found just incredible in the book from Evan Rachel Wood is she was saying something to, I'm paraphrasing here, but basically she said, I still believe integrity has currency. The people who follow their integrity still are going to have to sit out more rounds of the game or whatever and Mm -hmm. stay on the sidelines, but they're not going to play the same game. And I'm okay with that. And I don't know. I just, I I, I don't know. I think I believe (laughs) that too. Do you kind of agree? Like integrity still yeah. does have currency? I do. And, and you know, here's here's the thing. Sometimes I look at some of the most successful people in the industry and I'm like, okay, so you have $100 million and no one you've known in the past will speak to you because you were you treated them so badly or mo- many people from your past will no longer have anything to do with you. You could have had $60 million and been respected. Or let, you know what I mean? Like it's currency beyond money. Yeah. Right. You, you know, like, I'm like, what did you actually gain from that? Like, you know, it, that's the crazy thing to me is that again, it doesn't extend to everyone. Some people do take a real risk by staying with their integrity. And by that, I mean, we've all, we've all read that interview with the actor is so many actors have said this and I absolutely believe it. Oh, I was on my way out of the industry. And I, then I got the call from the casting director or from my agent that changed my life because I'd been cast in this or that. So we've all heard the sort of hard luck tale of someone who's on their way out of the industry. And then the magical thing happened. And, and that's great. But I've talked to a lot of people who never got that call, not because they're bad at what they do, not because they're a bad, mean, unprofessional, or in some way problematic person. Not for any of those reasons, they're out of the industry because the industry just basically, they did live within their integrity and stick with their values and live by their values and take actions that align with their values. And it costs them a lot, like it costs them their careers, essentially. So. So I don't mean to minimize the risk that people are taking, but I think that's why I say in the book, um, I'm, I'm so glad that you picked up on that quote from Evan. I, I think it's so true that. There are a number of people who are in a more gray area. They could act with integrity. They could use the scraps of power that they have. And I'm not the judge of that. Like, however people act or don't act or do or don't do to preserve their career, their mental health, you know, mental and physical safety, I'm not here to judge that. What I do judge is when people have some kinds of protection, if not multiple kinds of protection, whether that's power, privilege, connections, access, money, or all those things. And they genuinely, continually make choices that are out of alignment with their state of values. They essentially don't use the juice that they have in any way to do anything but to further their own goals and take selfish steps. That's where I'm like, I don't know if I want to use the word judge, but I have I have a lot of side eye for that because it's like, can we stop making it about the lower level workers or the crew or the, even the mid level workers or the um, junior executives? Stop making it about them having to come forward and expose this stuff. That's one of the things that kind of sets me off is that people are like, oh, so and so should no, don't tell me what people should or shouldn't do. I try very hard because I've heard a million stories. It's actually fairly easy for me, kind of like not to be in that judge judgment mode. And I think sometimes people people think I'm going to judge them. And I'm like, look, I'm not judging you because people will say to me, oh, I should have done this or I could have done more of that. And so what I continually say is, were you the most powerful person in that scenario? No. Okay, then you probably weren't going to be the one, like, unless you were the head of that studio or, you know, an executive overseeing that project or, you know, someone very high level, even though you have a title that sounds fancy or even though you are established within the industry, you were not probably going to be able to change that. And so what I often also just throw it back to people with is the following. I'll say, okay, but you're still in the industry now, right? Yep. Then you can set a different example now. We can't, none of us can change the past. There are things in my past professionally that I wish I'd done differently or questions I wish I'd asked. But, you know, until someone delivers to my door a working TARDIS from Doctor Who, which, you know, I'm waiting <laughs> for that still. I've been waiting a long time. But, but okay. 
we can't change the past. What we can do is say, all right, I have regrets about this, that, and the other. How can I independently or with other people? And I think the latter is actually often, you know, even more effective. How can I live within how can I take actions that are in alignment with my personal and professional beliefs? But I have the most expectation, I guess I would put it that way, from the people who are most protected, privileged, insulated, whatever you want to call it. Those people who have, essentially, if I if I can just be craving about it, the people who are going to be rich for the rest of their lives, no matter what, even if they never work a day in their lives, again. Right, the book stops with them. I, I really want them to be the ones stepping up to the plate and not the script coordinator living in a one bedroom in West Hollywood and essentially more or less exiled from the industry because that person got within the sights of one powerful person who blackballed them. As much as Hollywood wants to present itself as like, you know, a caring and sharing circle. You know, as you were saying all that, I just was thinking about the chapter in the book about Lorne Michaels and people mm -hmm. on sets like that who have this interesting status of like wanting credit, but also not accountability. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of talk about that chapter of the book? That's, it is an interesting perch to have to be a sort of critic slash reporter for this long. It's interesting. Sometimes I've written something negative about a show and I'll get an email from like someone associated with that show or even the PR team going, yeah, I agree with you. Or even the person in charge of that project, like, yeah, no, you're right. That was a bad. That's interesting. I think there are people who truly are within a creative field to learn, you know, really to learn about themselves, to use creativity, to explore the human condition, their own minds, their own past. That's all great. Bring it. But there seems to be this creeping thing. And I use Saturday Night Live and comedy as kind of a, a way into this topic. There seems to be this belief within the world that, that waxes and wanes, but it especially seems to be growing now. And it's not just in political spheres, it's in entertainment spheres too. You just sit there and absorb the entertainment or the, or the comedy or the jokes. You don't get to have an opinion about them. I'm like, that's kind of my whole thing. People get to talk back. And that's why it was so interesting to me to intertwine together this sort of free speech for me and not for the idea mm -hmm. along with this thing that is not not certainly the sole province of Lorne Michaels, but somebody has a kingdom in which they have all the power. All the effective power is in the hands of one person or maybe a couple, two or three people. When you do that, and when you have a lot of people who are underpaid or not paid as many interns weren't for a while in many, many companies, when you have very few or even only one person with an enormous amount of power, not just to get people the opportunities they want, but to blackball them from future work in their chosen field. And then also a lot of other people, like no, nobody else effectively has that much power. I mean, even if you have your name in the cast roster of SNL, compared to Lauren Michaels, you have zero power. The world might think you have power, but you kind of don't. And I think it's interesting that, as in the case of Jane Doe, who filed this civil lawsuit, which is now ended, against SNL regarding allegations that she made about what occurred while she went went to SNL parties and an SNL cast member, she alleges that he assaulted her. You know, I mean, these are very serious allegations, and they happened, according to her, she alleges they were happening in and around that show. That's what happens. Me too is what happens. The me too on a global scale is what happens is when people have enormous power, enormous reach, enormous influence, and no checks on any of that. That's just what is going to keep happening unless we examine these systems in more detail. In the back of my mind with that chapter, I was like, oh, I'm going to get that remark that women so often get. Oh, she's humorless. She's a killjoy. You don't know how to take a joke. Well, Comedy and jokes, when they work, they're often about power relationships, aren't they? It's like, oh, this mm -hmm. is funny because I'm taking a swipe at how this power relationship influence works or how people do or don't conduct themselves. That's often what's funny about a joke. But I'm mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, I get that I'm not being like super hilarious writer here, but we have to talk about how in comedy spaces especially... This is especially horrific. And I'm talking about improv, scripted comedy, stand-up, sketch. I just have talked to so many people from those worlds. And it's like, why is this especially terrible? And mm -hmm. the reason is because a lot of the, in a lot of those realms, you are not paid anything. 
if anything, it probably costs you something to like take classes or to get to the comedy club or get to the improv. People are essentially paying into the system that is often exploiting their labor and then in some cases abusing them. So that does not seem great to me, nor does it seem especially hilarious. That chapter of the book about comedy is a guise for misbehavior and stuff, or kind of an excuse for it, I just found very interesting because it did, I think, kind of capture the nuances of it because comedy can be just such an incredible tool for a, a way in to really understand issues and the opposite of one-way interactions. It's like a critical thinking prompter. Yes. Yes. Um, but then you have people who misuse and exploit what comedy does to get people off guard. Yes, and what I see happening a lot, especially in comedy spaces, other people are policed and sometimes policed out of the industry entirely by people testing the boundaries via quote-unquote jokes. So a woman will walk into the comedy writer's room. Those writers, whether or not they will admit that to themselves, some of them, what they want to do is see how much misogyny she'll be willing to take, see how much homophobia that person will be willing to take, whether or not they themselves are gay. A lot of comedy is about testing boundaries, but a lot of times it's used against people as a weapon. We're going to keep saying things and see if this, we're going to make, especially around race. I cannot tell you how many people, you know, oh, they're patting themselves on the back because they hired one black writer. And then that black writer is expected to put up with jokes that are just joking around, just have a sense of humor. And it's not funny. It's really a means of testing how much biased or questionable willing to tolerate and it's a lot of these spaces operate on like mind games around power mm -hmm. and as much as i would love for comedy to be this place of incredible ferment and freedom and sometimes it can be and sometimes it is sometimes the way that power is skewered is very funny and actually very effective and, and kind of like changes the conversation within a whole culture that is great but we have to talk about the ways that can be used for evil like I did a two hour interview with Jeff Garland in which he's like, oh, I'm just joking when I say these words on set or when I do this or when I do that. And then before and after that conversation, especially after a lot of people came to me and said this incident that he was referring to with a stand in, it was not funny. He was like, oh, I was just joking around and the joke didn't land. And then multiple people alleged to me that is not at all what transpired. And they did not appreciate him saying, oh, I just go around the set and I'm being funny and the crew loves it and the cat, everyone loves it. And it's funny. They were all like, no, that gets used as a weapon sometimes. of like, I'm just a lovable jokester. It's like, mm, you might think that or you might tell yourself that, but other people not so much agreeing with that. Yeah, it's interesting. This duality, people who say comedy is superficial, don't read into it, versus oh, right. versus comedy is... We're so important. We're yeah. so... Uh-huh. Yeah, please decide which it is. Either comedy is this incredibly important canary in the coal mine, or it's just joking around. Womp womp. You gotta pick a lane, guys. Which one is it? Yeah. Another myth you discuss in the book is the myth of meritocracy, which mm -hmm. is somewhat related. I found particularly helpful just kind of clarifying in my mind what that conversation is about. Some of the metaphors you used, like there was one in the book about um, people have like a high wire act in Hollywood and some people have more padding when they go on the high wire than other. Yeah, I mean, that was a tough one to get right. There's so many things in the book that were hard to get right, but I really wanted to make it clear. I understand that if you want to sustain a long term career in the industry, no matter who you are it is still sometimes difficult. I mean, Tom Hanks has had some movies that didn't succeed. You know what I mean? Like, no, mm -hmm. nobody's, you can't point to anyone and go, all of their work succeeded commercially or creatively and all of their experiences on set or lining up projects, all of that was pleasant and good. Like, no, no one has that. Like, that's not a thing. But what I wanted to make people understand was that I'm just going to be really blunt. I think there are a lot of well-intentioned privileged people in Hollywood who don't want to look too closely at the protections or the padding that they do have. And I think that that conversation, we really need to have the conversation. Yeah, okay, we, we should. But we also need to take action on the fact that every few years, Hollywood has a conversation on race. And then mm -hmm. the gatekeepers who decide what gets made remain the same small cadre, usually of white people. So like, that's not... 
Hollywood's good at doing performative thing, which I guess makes sense because it's performance oriented, but yeah. we shouldn't be too hard on, a, you know, the whole idea is to like create an impression or to create a performance. But in the industry itself, what happens is a lot of privileged people don't go, want to go beyond the most superficial conversation around these things. It's like, yeah, no, we need action. Conversations are fine if they actually move the ball down the field, if there's some actions that are taken as a result of those talks. But a lot of times things peter out at the talk stage. You know, I just saw the other day that, you know, Netflix had commissioned a series that was supposed to like delve into the problems of race and this, that, and the other. And you can put something into development, as I say in the book, but to actually make it, that takes sustained money sustained time, sustained attention. And I think when it comes to issues of privilege, hierarchies, race, gender, all of these things, Hollywood just, I think it almost like cultivates a short attention span. Honestly, it's, well, we talked about that three years ago. Yes, we did. And the stats remain the same. Sorry, (laughs) we need to talk about it again and not just talk. That's where it gets tricky because It's absolutely correct what one of my sources said, and many people have told me, if you have a source of income that is not your job, or, you know, you have a safe place to live because you're connected and your family has a house, if you have certain legs up in the industry or certain advantages on those, when you're on those lower tiers of the industry, if your dad is a notable tentpole film director, and because of him, he has cameras laying around or whatever, that's helping you. And I I think there's more recognition now from the those people like, yes, I did have help. Yes, I did have access to this person or that meeting or that money. The, the number of privileges or advantages people have can vary a lot and not all of them are the same. But for years, I wrote about the problems with lack of inclusion among directors. And so the studios would tell me, oh, but we have this program where we have a shadowing program and, you know, people can get into that shadowing program and then, you know, maybe sometime down the road get experience as a director. I'm like, right. So here's the thing about this. You are not guaranteed a credit. Like you are not guaranteed a directing gig in many of them, if not most of them. And second of all, I would hear all the time about the studio executive's niece or daughter or the connected agent's, you know, relative getting those slots. How is this helping anyone? Because, by the way, a lot of those programs, there would be four to six graduates from that program per year. And again, none of those people necessarily got a credit out of it, got something to put on their IMDb. Do you know what I mean? These are very token efforts, and they're not often enough. There must be much more active efforts made. And I do think that more active efforts are being made when it comes to directors for hire, when it comes to casting, when it comes to who creates TV shows, who is the creator and director and writer of studio films, who are the studio executives who greenlight TV and film. Those rosters have not changed much in years. I feel like the big issue with the conversation is that it flattened into this whole, you know, Nepo baby or whatever you want to call it, framing where it's like people take personal offense. Are you saying I didn't work hard for what I have? And the The issue is not specific like that. It's more broad. and Right. And that's why I was trying to broaden it out exactly what you said, because let's take it beyond did one person's feelings get hurt? Mm -hmm. Let's take it beyond that. Let's look at the data. I have been studying the data around this industry for over 25 years. The data is very informative. Like I very, it's interesting to me. I don't know if there's another field where there's as many stats as there are in Hollywood. It's actually, I, I know of a number of places that churn out stats yearly or every other year. There are so many different academic and nonprofit or just there's so many different ways that information about the industry is sliced and diced and presented. And the stats tell the story. You know, let's, okay, then let's not hurt one person's feeling. Let's not her this person who's the daughter like okay i'm not it is what it is that person does have advantages if they're the daughter or the son or the you know nephew of somebody famous and very wealthy and connected let's talk about what has this studio done to hire anyone who does not come from a certain strata strata of society and by the way you know one of my sources said we also should talk about 
are we hiring people who are from, say, rural backgrounds? What is their income level, whatever their race? I think Hollywood's terrible at actually issues to do with class. That's why, you know, every time you turn on the TV, when I was growing up in the like 80s and 90s and even beyond, every house you saw was like a very lavish, supposedly middle class house. Mm -hmm. You know, at least you had like Roseanne or Good Times. There were like when I was growing up, there were some shows where it was just like these are working class people. But the more you have privileged or protected or however you want to call it, like the more people come from this one insular slice of humanity, what is passed off as, as normal is just not attainable for many people. You know, I, I live in the Midwest and people are like, oh, you don't live in L.A.? I'm like, no, I'm a journalist. How could I ever afford living in L.A.? That's insane. Are you, are you kidding me? Like, <laughs> I have right now, pick it up and move it to Santa Monica. I don't have that $10 million. I mean, mm -hmm. I just don't. It seems like the discussion about diversity gets so flat into race when it's like there's so much – I don't know. It just, to me, it never fails to baffle me how resistant people are to diverse writers' rooms, diverse stories in right. every way, because it's not just, it's diverse in every way. Like, how could you not want more variety in your, your creativity spaces? You yeah, know? because the sad fact is Hollywood is not incentivized toward creativity. I'm just going to say it. It's not. It's mm -hmm. incentivized toward even more so than when I began covering it toward what worked before. So that's not to say that executives, writers, directors, artisans of all kinds, many people have fought to do the more creative thing or more, the more interesting thing or the more challenging thing. But certainly right now, the industry is incentivized toward the most profits that can be made because, you know, the tech giants want these massive returns on their investments. Many of them are now in this like Hollywood arena. And the big companies want these returns on investments for their shareholders. The executives want these giant pay packages and stock bonuses. So everything is incentivized toward, and this was always a thing in the industry, what worked before and can we do that again? And honestly, on some level, I get that. A lot of the things I like the most, I mean, Poker Face is a really fun show. It's very much on the template of Columbo or like classic detective shows that I grew up with. That's fine. You know, Shakespeare constantly riffed on things that he read. You know, like yeah. artists is riffing on things, you know, probably that they picked up at somewhere along the line. But now... The fear factor in the industry is greater than ever because there's so much turmoil, so many layoffs. Now the strike obviously is increasing a lot of that turmoil, but it's kind of a bummer for me, to be honest. One example I'll offer up to you, um, Sean Ryan, to whom I am not related as far as I know, pitched a show called The Shield to FX and they bought it and they made it one of the best series that ever, ever on TV. At that time, that was not existing IP, obviously, although cop dramas, like we knew what those were. So it, it kind of had spiritual antecedents, but it wasn't specifically based on a known work of any kind. And also Sean Ryan was just a, a journeyman writer at that time. He was had been knocking around the industry, you know, doing, uh, you know, as a staff, essentially on writing staffs here and there. He wasn't a, a big, well-known name, certainly not the big, well-known name he is now. Obviously, he's done many of the things, including The Night Agent, which I really enjoyed. I just wonder if that can happen now. I mean, I'm really glad Boots Riley and C. Chun made this incredible show called I'm Virgo, which again, not based on anything. I'm not saying never make anything based off existing IP ever again. Obviously, I'm not saying that, but I think that's taken over too much. And there are so many creative people in the industry who are, frankly, I think at this point being stifled because everybody wants something based on a previous show, a book, a previous movie. There's just so much rigidity around who can make what. And now you have to be a much bigger deal to even get anything made in many cases it just feels like a fair bit of the creative ferment and even the mistakes. I'll never forget like writing about Viva Laughlin, which was not a good TV show, but CBS decided to take a big swing. And that actually was based on IP. It was based on a really good UK show called Viva Blackpool, which is definitely worth looking up. They took a big swing and decided to make Viva Laughlin, which was like a musical drama hybrid about people in and around a casino. And it wasn't good, but it was like a really interesting failure. And now I just feel like we have very formulaic failures. <laughs> more good stuff, obviously, but also just more risk taking. And I feel like that's kind of being squeezed out of the industry. 
you mentioned in the book that you covered the writer's strike of 07. Mm -hmm. And I would just love to know what your thoughts are on how you've seen strike and in comparison to how you covered that or the same issues being dealt with or like what are the similarities and differences you see? Yeah, I've actually covered, obviously, I know a lot of people who are on the picket lines now for this strike. And I there was a near strike. And I was still at Variety at that time. I covered that as well, like the lead up to that Writers Guild potential strike, which was headed off. So I've really been following issues to do with the Hollywood guilds for, you know, 20 years or more. I do think there's been a real, really interesting change that has occurred. And in the Writers Guild especially, and you still find this, but less so than before. What you often had at the top tiers of the Writers Guild was people who have made hundreds of millions of dollars by, they oversee large empires had a lot of shows that were hits or a lot of films that were hits. They occupy this odd space in that they are, yes, they are in the Writers Guild, but they are essentially running giant corporations, which have many productions, many films and TV shows. The priorities of someone who is worth tens of millions of dollars are going to be different than the priorities of someone who is two years into their WGA membership, you know, and just kind of trying to string together a career. And that's always going to be the case. You know, you're going to have differing people, of different outlooks, different income levels, different privileges and histories and all the rest of it. But what I've seen happen over the years is a recognition from most, if not all, I wouldn't say all, but for most people in the guild that the ways the industry has changed, especially in the last, I would say, eight to 10 years has been disastrous, really. I mean, I remember writing about, I don't know, 10 years ago, maybe, and saying, oh, it's unusual that one of my favorite shows, Spartacus, they're doing 10 episode seasons. That's interesting, you know, or maybe it was, I don't know, more like 14 years ago, I wrote that piece. But now I laugh at that because now like six is seems like the norm or eight, 10 might seem like a lot now and again I came up in a time when if a show was a hit then making 26 episodes was not that unusual some shows when they were hits had 30 episodes in a season and now some shows don't even get like 22 you know so it's very weird it's a very weird situation that I don't love but I think a lot of creative people don't love it either for a number of reasons and one of them is just a very boring word but it's just residuals A lot of the reason the shows that you love or the films that you love exist is because people were living on residuals and could develop or write or work on a project because they had this other income source. If you wrote an episode of Law and Order or Gilmore Girls or Private Practice or whatever it was, you had a weekly fee when you were on that staff. And so the obvious math is if your weekly fee, if you only get that for eight weeks or 20 weeks or 18 weeks, that's a lot less than what it used to be back in the day when it was over 40 weeks a lot of times or, you know, maybe 30. So your weekly, you're getting less of your weekly fee, but you also would get, if you were, if your name was the sole name on a script, you'd get a script fee that your reps would negotiate for you. And the Writers Guild has floors for these amounts, but a lot of people have a higher quote than that, you know, for their script fee. That was typically a five figure sum. You get it when it aired the first time, but if they did a Gilmore Girls marathon or a private practice marathon or showed a rerun or had a Law & Order marathon on the weekend on TNT, the first time it was rerun, you would get another substantial check. Not the full amount, but a lot. It varies in terms of how that all works. There's not a one-size-fits-all. But essentially, if you were a working writer and had been a working writer for a while, you would have this income source to cushion the blow when you were developing work, too much of which is unpaid, in my personal opinion, or when you had other, trying to get other things off the ground or hadn't found a new gig yet, that sort of thing. Now that has essentially fallen off a cliff. People have much shorter gigs. They have to cobble together as many gigs as they can. They're not getting as many weeks where they're paid their weekly rate. And then script fees and residuals, that is all less than it was 10 years ago, definitely 15 years ago. You know, there's a lot of things that I have written about and other writers have written about as being, you know, kind of the bad old days. And we don't want to go back to when writers rooms were not inclusive at all, brutal to people psychologically, (laughs) even physically. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go back to the bad stuff of the bad old ways. But even and this affects the crew guilds as well, even the directors as well, actors, this affects them too. All these things we're talking about, people are working twice as hard to make half as much as they used to. 
I mean, that's the easiest way to explain it. You know, the American television machine was a machine for printing money for a really long time. Just the other day, I tweeted something from, I believe, the writer um, Lucas Shaw from Bloomberg. The amount of profits these corporations are putting out has also fallen off a cliff. So they're all free fall in terms of the money that they're making. And so I don't love this for any of us, you know? I mean, just... Yeah, it's not sustainable. It's not sustainable because as much as everybody's favorite executive, David Zaslav, at one point in the (laughs) the beginning of this strike was like, oh, people, I think people really want to work. Yes, they want to work for money. They need money. You know, living in L.A., New York, even Atlanta, Vancouver, London, all of these production centers are very expensive places to live. They got more expensive over the last 15 years. So all of it's unsustainable. The math in like any which way you want to slice the math doesn't work. Two big differences I see, especially from the 07, 08 strike to now, is that cohesion among writers, certainly. Obviously, the directors made a separate deal. We can debate all day whether they should have. Um, I think it's possible. I think it's very possible, in fact, that the actors might go out on strike because I think writers and actors are really taking it on the chin with all of these factors I just discussed. Uh, But there's much more unanimity on the idea when you talk to anyone in any Hollywood guild, there's much more cohesion and solidarity and unanimity about the idea that we are all being affected by these structural changes and none of these effects are good. Like realistically, it's just not good. So that's why Teamsters are not crossing picket lines. The creators of Stranger Things put down their pens and said, we're not writing anymore. Most shows have been shut down. Many, many productions have been shut down. That was all people showing solidarity, even if they have a lot of money in the bank, even if they have high profile projects in many cases. There's much more unanimity among the working professionals in the industry, among many guilds. The second big change I wanted to bring up, I think the public is far more educated about this stuff. I think the public and even, you know, the media, there's much more understanding that your average working actor, your average working writer, your average working director, I mean, I've been inside these people's houses. They're not living large. Most people I know have always put a lot of money in the bank to tie them over because you can have a dry spell. You can not work for a year or two years. Like that happens. So people in this industry are very used to having a precarious existence. But I think the public is now much more aware of how precarious it is and how it's gotten more precarious over the past 10 years. When we see like these companies haven't gone out of business, you know, like Warner Brothers and Netflix are not like, oh God, we're teetering on bankruptcy. Amazon's not exactly exactly like, oh gosh, you know, if this show with this person doesn't work, we're toast. These companies are massive, massive multinationals and they are not on the ropes. For whatever reasons, creative people across the board or people attached to or working in creative industries are taking it on the chin. And I think the average Joe or Jane who watches these shows and goes to the movie theater, they understand this, that yes, Tom Cruise is going to be wealthy forever. But for most people, they are just like you and me trying to pay their bills and put a little money away so that their kid can go to college or so that they have money for, you know, when some disaster happens in their life. And really that margin of error, though, for a lot of people, it just went away. It largely went away. People had savings or they were able to have a little nest egg, maybe. But one thing that makes me really upset is that the gates of the industry, the gatekeeping, the gates opened a bit, if you will. And a more inclusive array of people did begin to start to scale the ladder. But that ladder was then made of even more precarious twigs and collapsed. So it really, really makes me upset that whoever they are, a lot of people trying to rise now in the industry are not getting the training, the backup, the nest egg, the support that they need to stay in the industry. So if the industry is like, oh, well, we, why is it that USC did a study of the top 100 grossing films of the last 16 years? They did a meta analysis of 1600 films. Of those 1600 films, 21 total were directed by women of color. So if the industry is like, oh, we should fix that. Yeah, the way that you fix that is by making people able to have money to buy food, you know, to like have a place to live. It's not actually that difficult. There are many hurdles that people from less protected classes, and I use the word in the book, historically excluded communities, because I think that that's the largest and most sort of encompassing way to talk about some of these things. The people who have been historically excluded have a lot of factors working against their success. And if you're 
saying that, well, you have to work as an ex assistant for 10 years. And these assistant jobs, by the way, they pay very little because the expectations when they were set up was that, oh, you'll serve out your time as an assistant for two or three years and then you'll move up. People aren't moving up now. There's nowhere to move up to. And so people are being asked to work on these ridiculously low wages for years and if not decades at a time. The ladder of success has fallen apart. Every effort the industry wants to make to have more creativity in it, to have more inclusion in it, to have more artistry in it, it's all being held back. You know, you can honestly boil a lot of it down to simple financial math. If I graduate from college and I can take, you know, a job that will pay me six figures or even, you know, high, high five figures or whatever, the smart thing to do would be to take it somewhere far away from Hollywood where I can pay rent because most cities rents have gone up as opposed to, let's see, go to LA or New York and be paid an absurdly low salary for those particular cities, which are very expensive and have no expectation of being able to move up or put money in the bank and also have to sit there and have the expectation that I will likely be mistreated on the regular like that doesn't make any sense like that's not gonna having that be the structure of the industry is not helping anyone and I do think social media we could sit here all day and talk about the bad parts of it but social media and just the sort of like democratization of certain kinds of media have made it much more apparent to the average consumer that what the people in these guilds are asking for what the people in the industry are asking for you know baseline respect non-exploitative compensation all of those things are very rational and they are things that people in a lot of industries want People are unionizing and coming together across many different industries. You know, UPS drivers are looking at striking. In the last few years, we've had wildcat strikes. We've had Amazon workers organizing. I think all of these things are connected. And I think there's much less of a sense now that Hollywood is some kind of blessed land where you, you make it inside those gates and then you're rich, right? Like that's not how it works at all. And I think more people have that understanding and more sympathy, frankly. That actually kind of relates to what your whole book is about. I love that you end it by talking about why you called it Burn It Down and how it's not just about getting rid of what's clearly a bad mentality, a disposability mentality, but it's also about how fire can kind of cultivate and create something new. Does that kind of give you kind of hope for this current strike? This is a moment where like it's actually kind of room to be optimistic because people, they're powerful when they're together, you know? Yeah, I... It really moves me quite deeply emotionally to see the people on the picket lines. And look, I know that out on the picket lines, there are people who don't like each other or don't get along or, you know, have to walk by the person who mistreated them. Like, it's not like a perfect world, but at the same time, seeing people come together in that way, a lot of the reasons it's, it's inspiring to me have to do with sacrifice. And something that a lot of people don't know about the Writers Guild is how residuals even came to be. There were various labor actions in Hollywood over the years, and I won't go into all of them. At one point with the Writers Guild, they wanted residuals. They wanted to share in the success of something, and that's really what they're still fighting for now. Again, the corporations that run the industry shuffled the deck and said, oh gosh, we don't have residuals anymore. And then the writers were like, no, we, we should still share in success. Hmm. You know, one of the writers for The Bear should not have a negative bank balance. You know, that doesn't seem right. What happened when residuals really came into force and when, when the Writers Guild of America got those residuals written to their contracts, what they had to do to get that written to their contracts was say that this only applies to future projects. So thousands of people decades ago said, we will forego any claim to past residuals on past work. And they said, we're okay with that because we're doing this not just for our own future projects, but mainly for the people who come after us. And I'm telling you, I find that great, a wonderful, heartening thing, because if they hadn't fought for those residuals, then a lot of the stuff that I like wouldn't have gotten made because, again, that gave creative people the financial ability to continue in a very brutal punishing industry that is often, even for people who are established, people go through financial downtimes a lot. Every single person I know in the industry has had to do their share of retrenching, even people that you've heard of and think that might not apply to them. So if it were not for that sacrifice that writers in the past made, a lot of the entertainment that I love probably wouldn't have gotten made by the people who ended up having the ability to make it because they had had that payment structure kind of built into their life. One of the things that writers are fighting for, first of all, not have AI, have to rewrite AI, which sounds like genuinely the worst circle of hell as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> 
keeping that out for everyone's benefit, but also for the people coming up, there was a lot about the bad old days that was bad, but not all of it was bad. And one of the things that you had before was a writer's room. It wasn't just one, one person, go write six episodes of TV, go write eight episodes of TV pretty much on your own. And then in production, we'll just get somebody new and they'll just not have the same vision, but we'll just smash something together and put it on the air. Like we've seen those shows. We've all seen them. But what writer's rooms and writing staffs allowed was for people to learn the craft and learn all the skill sets that did not have to do with the page. Yes, they learned how to be better writers in many cases, but how do you do all the other things that you need to do when you are a creative leader? Not just a showrunner, but let's say you want to direct. Maybe you want to branch off into producing. Like you learned a lot ascending that ladder. And right now the Writers Guild is saying partly so that certain individuals don't get burnt up and tossed aside as used husks of human beings. You know, partly for them, but partly so that people can learn these skills and be in that creative environment where they do learn and they do have these sort of apprenticeship or mentorship opportunities. We have to have minimum room sizes. We have to have minimum, a minimum ladder so that everyone gets a benefit out of there being this being a group endeavor and so that's inspiring too a lot of what people are striking for and if sag goes out on the picket lines too i think the actors will be making the statement too is a lot of people are saying i don't want the people who are coming up now to be unable to pursue their craft not because they're bad at it not because they're unwilling to work hard but simply because it's not financially viable they mm -hmm. are going on strike due to that. And it's a lot of uncertainty there. I do think solidarity is high. I will say that too, in terms of, I really think that by around this point in the last strike, there was much more fracturing of solidarity, at least publicly, and much more of a sense that like, we should just make a deal and get back to the table and go, go to work. And I think that people understand this time that even more so than in the last strike, this is an existential moment. I think that when it comes to AI, again, an inspiring thing, it's a terrifying thing, but it's also an inspiring thing, like the Battle of Helm's Deep in the Lord of the Rings films. Like, if they don't make this stand now, I fear for all of our future. And I say that as someone who is a professional writer. Publications, for magazines, for newspapers, for every blog and publication in the world, for print, for online. I now have written a book. This is a line in the sand saying to these large corporations that control our media environment saying there have to be limits around this and those limits have to be meaningful and real. And the limits have to protect people engaged in creative work. Designer wants to use a computer program to design a dress. I'm not saying, oh God, no, this can never happen. You know, like, it, yeah. I think most reasonable creative people are like, this might at certain points in the process allow me to display my creativity or like help me get to this point where I can envision what the set will look like with this program. Okay, that's fine. But there have to be meaningful guardrails and what Hollywood has been bad at, what the Hollywood powers that be, I should say, has been really bad at is constructing meaningful guardrails in terms of behavior and norms and the financial viability of these careers. Because the mentality has been people who come through the door and want to be part of the industry, they're disposable. We can just get new ones. If we burn these ones out or damage them or destroy them, we'll just get new ones. Yeah, that's the big word that I just that kept going through my mind is disposable. Like this feels like a moment to for all sorts of people, actors, writers, or just people who are viewers and seeing this unfold on social media to totally. be like, hey, we want to publicly show our support and our defense saying, hey, what they do is not disposable. It's not replaceable. It's not. It's important. And also using AI to write a script. Look, I've written a book. If you think that you can get 150 sources to trust an AI to do the <laughs> in-depth reporting that I do, God mm -hmm. bless. You know, thanks a lot. I could use the help. But no, it's like, it is a line in the sand. I've read many AI researchers or people who are experts in this field saying, we should have breaks on this. And by the way, I've seen some examples of this stuff and I'm like, I don't get it. Like, it's this is what a hungover college sophomore would write when their paper was due in an hour. This is not anything. Like, and yeah, even if you make it better, are you going to be able to structure a three-hour film or two and a half hour film to be emotionally engaging? I don't think so. Like, you know, it's not pay people to do their work and to learn their craft. And what these people are all asking for, it's not unreasonable. And whether or not we're talking about the strike, just in general, I don't think there's anything crazy about anything anyone's asking for.
Yeah, I agree. I just think it's, um, feel like, yeah, the television film or whatever kind of parts we're talking about, they're so inherently human. And that's what you respond to, right? Yeah. And so the thought of saving a couple of bucks by just hiring AI or something just to me feels so short sighted and misses the whole point of making anything. Well, you've just described too much of the management mentality of Hollywood. I mean, look at literally anything David Zadlav has done in the last two years. And you're like, yeah, this is not a guy who's thinking long term. It's discouraging, but, you know, a lot of what I think is that Hollywood is both a cautionary tale and an inspirational tale. People realized a hundred years ago, oh, we are disposable. That is not a new thing, especially during the the Depression. People realized they are just going to exploit us even more than they already are if we don't come together in some kind of way to, to forestall that or to deal with that. And they were right. They were right to do that. Can you imagine the industry we'd had if no industry guilds ever formed ever? I mean, what what entertainment would we have? What would we be talking about? Would we have the shows and the creators and the works and the films that we have? I don't think we would. I don't think they'd be as good. It's interesting to me that by this point in the Writers Guild strike, all these companies have lost more than they if they had just agreed to pretty much what the guilds wanted on day one. Yeah. They're now working on the different assumption that, oh, we are a streamer. We have so much content on our platforms. We can just wait all of this out. I'm like, I don't know. The streamers have kind of broken the implied or even overt promise of the streaming age, which was as long as you pay us a monthly fee, the content that we have, most of it will be there forever. I mean, we did understand that like, oh no, Netflix lost the office and now it's just on Peacock. Like we do understand that as consumers that like, it's not always going to be in multiple places or it will go from one platform to another. But if you made a show for this streamer, it would stay there. And now that's gone. I don't think that this is sustainable, even for these large corporations, the way that they're operating. But the thing is, it is interesting, like coming from you as like a fan perspective, because I think a lot of fans now, um, and this may be another difference between the strike in the past and now is just like a lot of fans are feeling very personally invested in the fight because it's like, you just took away my favorite show, <laughs> like like yeah. out of the blue, no warning, you know, there's a sense of give it back. <laughs> yeah, there's just, I, I get that sense too. I'm actually, I'm glad you said that because, you know, sometimes I'm like, am I in my own little bubble? No, I sense that, yeah. Yeah, no, I I get the sense that people are like, why am I paying for this again? You know, and that's, I don't even go into that in my book, the idea, Batgirl, just shelved. We're just not even going to release it. I don't even go into my book, uh, the whole idea of like disappearing shows. Single drunk female, okay, we're not going to make a third season. Also, now it's just gone. I do think that they've underestimated how much anger that, that that kind of action would inspire, not just in the creators of those works, who I think are justifiably furious, save like pennies on the dollar. You're going to take away something that people worked on for years that nowadays, in many cases, they don't even have a copy of it to show their friends or their kids or whatever. That's insane. And that's very, very much driving the anger. It's not the only factor influencing whether people are willing to go out on strike, but it's certainly a factor. And I think amongst viewers too, it's like the promise of the streaming age is that a TV show's run would be as long as the creator wanted it to be, or as long as the story could sustain. So as long as that story could be sustained, it would keep going. Now it's 16 episodes and out, 12 episodes and out, 23 episodes and out. I don't think that that's good. It should be determined by how much more road does this story demand and what do the creative people behind the story think, should it keep going or not? Now we're just getting all these short run shows that can be yanked away at a moment's notice. And how is this different from in 2007, you know, ABC canceling a show after eight episodes? How is that different? Oh, streamers are different. We're going to not be like the bad old broadcast networks. I'm like, I don't, how are you not like the bad old broadcast networks who would cancel stuff when you're doing the exact same stuff and making it so that nobody can ever watch ever again, apparently? Well, it feels even more of a frustration now because there's just like a complete lack of actually just DVD printing of them. You can't physically go out and buy your favorite show on DVD even anymore. Yeah. 
I mean, it was a big deal to me when the creator of the television version of Station Eleven said, oh, you can now like get a DVD and like, did a special. They basically prepared it for DVD and it was, you can now purchase it. And I just think just that one show alone, there's so much artistry, you know, even in this IP driven age. And obviously Station Eleven was a very successful book, but what that book did that was so smart and so moving and so cool was what the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings films did, which was they translated for me anyway, like the emotional experience of reading that book to things that were smart for the screen. And so they changed things or left some things out or added some things, but in ways that really were very much in alignment with what that source material was about and was doing. And so the idea that things like that would just get pulled and go away forever and you can't even get a DVD of them. I mean, as someone who's spent their adult life covering issues to do with popular culture, it just sends a chill down my spine. It's bad. It's bad for the culture. It's bad for all of us. It's not good. It feels like, I don't know, there's something about the tangible presence of something you put your all into, you know, that, again, I go back to the word disposable. It just feels like a, a time to be like, look, this is not disposable, what people it's created. Not. Absolutely. Like this, it sh- the, the, the work shouldn't be disposable and the people shouldn't be either. You can go that route, the short-term thinking route, but where short-term thinking typically gets someone is to the edges of a cliff and then you fall off that cliff and then it's bad. Bad things can be bad things. Yeah. There are reasons to be nervous, but I do also think that there is a critical mass of people in the industry who don't want kind of like the bad sliding door scenarios to come about. And they're trying their very best to not make that happen. Yeah, for sure. I'll be closely watching this. So I won't take up too much more of your time now, but I do want to say again, thank you for your time. Really do appreciate the book. I think it captures just so many things that I have been thinking a lot about lately. It just like captures a lot of the nuance of Hollywood and like how much you could love pop culture. Like I love pop culture and despise it at the same time and like the nuances of wanting to make it better. And I just felt like it did a good job with that showing the way forward because everything we just talked about could be pretty demoralizing but at the same time I just think part of your book I just want to mention to stress it is that it's so not just like a a bunch of terrible incidents on sets it has a ton of those but it has a whole half of it about how things could change for the better and there are constructive relatively simple straightforward long-term thinking based ways that a better future for the industry is possible. Well, I thank you for all of that. And I do think that was the hope with writing the book. Frankly, you just sort of summarized all of it, that the book would be more lasting than an article. And so, you know, I I definitely had the feeling, (laughs) I think that a lot of people who have a film about to come out or a TV show about to come out, like, will anyone care? Will I be, you know, screaming into the void? To know that people have engaged with it as you have so kindly and so deeply and have thought about it and that it will, you know, sit on library shelves and bookshelves. That's really heartening to me because I did also want there to be a lasting document to put in the world to say, not only are these good people who are willing to evolve and are willing to lead the industry in better directions, not only are those people real and active and doing their best, but they've always been in the industry. There's like the stereotype of, oh, Hollywood is all a bunch of people who are, you know, in a sharing circle and it's all like nice and stuff like that. That's not true. But there's also the stereotype that it's dog eat dog and it's only brutality. And that's not true at all. People that I really respond to both their work and oftentimes them as people, they have a joy in creation with each other and in collaboration that is super inspiring. And I wanted to give them a spotlight. And a lot of those people came up in brutal work environments. In some cases, those brutal work environments left scars on them that are still there, but they chose not to go down the dark path. And that was something I really wanted to make visible and legible to the world, more more visible to the world that a lot of people are making better choices, doing their best. And as you say, these are often common sense solutions or common sense attitude. And they've brought those into their workplaces and honestly had a better time at work. And I think oftentimes the work is even better too. Are there any other final thoughts you wanted to make sure you said about the book or where people can buy it? No, I mean, just um, I'm grateful for everyone who has bought it. And if you choose to get it from a library, I understand because library demand is actually super important to authors. The publishers like to see that, too. Um, And if you buy it and engage with it, I'm just super appreciative. I really am grateful. Thank you so much for talking to me. I really did enjoy this. Same. 
Cool. And I really like the book. So. Oh, thank <laughs> um, you so, so much. See ya. <laughs> Take care. Bye.